Fitzgerald. I'm the director of the Augustinian Institute. We found ourselves in the midst of moving this summer from a place that was a little bit more peripheral to the St. Augustine Center, which seems to fit the name that, that is ours. And in some ways, we're looking forward to all the new relationships that uh, begin to happen. One of the things that the Augustinian Institute does is it sponsors the St. Augustine Lecture every year. Um, but before I get to that, I'd like to just make two rather brief comments. I'd like to point out that one of the other things that the Institute does it is it invites a fellow to campus each semester. And this semester, we have in our midst Patu Burns, who is the Thomas F. Martin. St. Augustine Fellow for 2012. Um, another new thing is that um, one of my colleagues, beloved colleagues, Jonathan Yates, has now been appointed director, or I should say editor, of the journal, Augustinian Studies, and is just starting on that new adventure. begins a conference that we have called Reconsiderations, a name chosen by Father Tom Martin for the first session that took place in 2003, a name that is synonymous with um, something that Augustine was all about, being willing to take a second look, being willing to look back over things said and revise them where necessary. And so it's a conference that gathers scholars from all over the world. And so we have a dozen scholars who tomorrow and Saturday will gather at the Villanova Conference Center for what I expect to be some lively and healthy exchange. But Reconsiderations always starts with the St. Augustine Lecture. And the last Reconsiderations that we had was done by a French woman Isabel Boucher, and we had a pretty big audience that night, although tonight it's clearly larger, probably because we know the man, we know him closely, we know him well. This lecture series began in 1959 and has been held every year for those for the last 52 years, this being the 53rd. So it's a really rich tradition of the contribution that Villanova has made to the scholarship surrounding St. Augustine because it is a conference or a, a lecture that not just anybody can give. Um, Villanova invites some well-known scholar in a way of trying to promote wider understanding, in a way of trying to see how Augustine might be relevant, important for us today in this fast-changing world. This year, a lecture will be given by James Richard Wetzel. Jim studied at Princeton, received his doctorate from Columbia, and the 17 years before he came to Villanova were spent at Colgate. In 2005, he came to the Augustinian. He came here as the Augustinian Endowed Chair in the Thought of St. Augustine and as a member of the Philosophy Department. Over the years, his commitment to teaching has been both recognized and awarded. That commitment is affirmed in an ongoing way in the Villanova classroom at Greater Kirk Prison and in the way he always makes time for conversation. His curriculum vitae is long. No need for me to try to rehearse it. It's available on the web. And I think Jim will be much happier if I just leave it there. Um, but on that, he lists his interest as late and early medieval philosophy, modern philosophy, religious thought, and postmodernism. 
In some way or another, Augustine is a significant part of each of those periods. And Augustine has certainly been a significant part of Jim's work and publication, as can be seen in the title of his latest book, Augustine, A Guide for the Perplexed, published last year, and in an earlier book, Augustine and the Limits of Virtue, one of those books that you can't just read once, <coughs> one of those books that in some ways blurs the lines between philosophy and theology, one of those books that has made a difference in the scholarship around Augustine, thanks to a man of gentle spirit, with a great sense of humor, wry though it may be, <laughs> and a man who, when I returned to the Lenovo over three years ago, became not only trusted, faithful colleague, but good friend. I've been benefited so much, it really surprised me when I realized that we had never invited him to do the St. Augusta lecture. And what is what we're at home with, of course, we often overlook. And this was simply not something to overlook. So tonight, Jim's lecture will be entitled, A Tangle of Two Cities. Let us all welcome Jim and enjoy it. Thanks for coming, folks. Uh, I just have a few words of gratitude before I uh, start my lecture proper. I'd like to thank Alan Fitzgerald and the Augustinian Institute for inviting me to become part of this extraordinary uh, tradition of lectureship. Alan has been a great colleague and friend, and over the years I've come to think of him as the lighthouse of Augustinian studies, and if any studies needs a lighthouse, it's Augustinian studies. Um, I'd also like to thank the Augustinians of the province of St. Thomas of Villanova for endowing a chair in Augustine's thought and allowing me to borrow it for a while and venture into the mind of a restless and still quite formidable spirit. My experience of Augustine and my fellowship with Augustinians has had the combined effect of unsettling my sense of my responsibilities as an educator. And at my age, such disquiet can be a good and even a welcome thing. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Patu Burns on campus, one of the great figures in North American patristics, who is this year's, as Alan told you, a Thomas Martin Fellow and a past St. Augustine lecturer himself. Uh, I read Patu's dense and important first book on Augustine's doctrine of operative grace when I was a graduate student wading through the Augustinian Ocean. And it's a book I return to often, especially when I feel lost. And it certainly informed the perspective of the lecture I'm about to give you tonight. And please, if what I have to say about grace and the two cities seems to you off or off-putting, feel free to blame the two. Uh, <laughs> that's what solidarity and sin means, after all, and I know that Petu will back me up on that. A Tangle of Two Cities. The long and arduous work that Augustine began in 413, a few years after Alaric sack of Rome, and finished in 427, a few years shy of his own death, is basically two things. It begins as an installment in a late antique culture war. Pagan intellectuals, unhappy to be living in Christian times, were reading Rome's vulnerability as evidence for the weakness of the Christian God and the unfitness of his otherworldly followers for the task of running an empire. Better the old gods, the old ways. In the first 10 books, The City of God, or what amounts to the first two of five parts overall, Augustine hammers the Roman gods for their failure to secure the well-being of their devotees either in this life or the next. Significantly, he does not go on to defend a Christian politics in the remaining three parts, though arguably there is one there to be unearthed. His avowed intent for books 11 through 22 of City of God is to detail the beginning, middle, 
an anticipated end of two contrasting cities. One glorifies God and disdains the self. The other glorifies the self and disdains God. Having begun largely as an installment in a culture war, City of God continues as a theological meditation on the meaning of human history. It is part of the enduring fascination of that book that the meditation on the two cities, as they work their way through a temporary entanglement, far outstrips the opening anti-pagan polemic. Augustine unsurprisingly favors Christians in a debate between Christians and pagans over the utility, social and otherwise, of certain religious beliefs and practices. But he is not willing to claim that a politicized Christianity is necessarily a boon for God-loving, unselfish people who, unlike their cynical, self-indulgent detractors, care about higher things. In the study that has framed four decades of scholarly debate over what Augustine is willing to claim about a Christian politics and the meaning of history, Robert Marcus holds Augustine to a religiously motivated agnosticism. Unlike a secular agnostic who keeps all religious frameworks at arm's length, the Augustine that Marcus describes does not doubt the reality of God or that the destiny of each and every human being is either to abide forever with God in heaven or languish forever without God uh, in hell. What this Augustine insists on not knowing ahead of time is the particulars of that division. It is only at the last judgment, the eschaton or ed time of history, that it becomes clear to all who is of God and who not. Meanwhile, in the cyclum, the time of mixing between the first coming of Christ and the show-stopping second, sacred history remains an eerily flattened landscape. Professing Christians signify through their practices and rituals who the God of the eschaton is, but nothing that they do or endure, no institution that they create, historically grand or historically feeble, signifies more than any other thing that the eschaton is nearing. There are no signs of the promised end of days, only one damn thing after another. This invisibility of the presence of eschatological categories in historical realities is, Marcus contends, the foundation of Augustine's theology of the seculum. I will have more to say about Professor Marcus and his sense of an Augustinian secularity later in the lecture, where I touch upon the politics of the terrena kivitas, the territorial or just plain earthly city whose deep rootedness in materiality connotes the mortal. For now, I want to pause and admire the conceptual knot that resides at the heart of Augustine's political theology. This whole strange business of two eternal cities ending up entangled in time. In the opening line of City of God, Augustine evokes the paradigmatic kibitas, more glorious than the shadow city that derives from it in its dual aspect. As the fully revealed seat of eternal stability, the City of God showcases unfallen angels and resurrected saints. As a colony in time, this same city, now veiled and rendered foreign, peregrina, takes in mortal saints who wonder history in faith and who share the earth with a dying city whose eternal counterpart is hell. In this description of a dual aspect city, there's already some kind of profound entanglement implied between the internal verities of heaven and hell and the shadow play within time uh, as a struggle between sin and sanctity. But when Augustine speaks of the permixti kiwatates, mixed cities, he refers primarily to a mix within time and only indirectly, if at all, to the background entanglements between time and eternity. In the penultimate chapter of Book One, a particularly favorite bit of City of God for Augustine's liberal readership, Augustine warns Christians not to condemn their pagan adversaries. Members of God's foreign city on earth need to bear in mind that some of their kind wander through bad religious allegiances before coming to acknowledge Christ. The head of the Kibitas, Peregrina, 
They must then not think it a fruitless labor, says Augustine, to show patience and restraint in the face of religious opposition. By the same token, there are members of the earthly city who pass through the doors of God's church, take the sacraments, and call themselves followers of Christ, and not, also, not all do so knowing the falsity of their own hearts. As Augustine describes it, the foreignness of the Kiwitas Peregrina is not a foreignness that is relative only to the perspective of outsiders, who may not, in fact, notice the foreignness at all. It is primarily, and perhaps solely, an offering to those on the inside who are being inducted into the irony of a healthy self-contempt. By the end of the first book of a multi-volume defense of Christianity against its noisiest secular adversaries, the cultured pagans, Augustine will have effectively denied his own side a familiar way of reverence. All of this ironing is doubtless reassuring to religious liberals like myself, who distrust imperialist theologies and sanctified nationalisms of any sort. But I am also a reader of Augustine who is convinced of the need to read the entanglement of the two cities, Terena and Peregrina, familiar and foreign, within the context of what must be for Augustine the more fundamental entanglement, that of heaven's intimate involvement in the earthly lives of its saints, the shadow side of which is, ne is the neglect of everyone else, the walking dead. Not to take this context into account, it's to suppose that Augustine's doctrine of radical grace, worked out over the course of the Pelagian controversy, has nothing to do with the political theology of the city of God, worked out over the course of that same controversy. It was, after all, a lyric sack of Rome that had sent a flood of refugees into the provinces and Augustine's orbit of attention. Some of the cultured among them Pelagius in Palestine, Kylestius in Carthage, would find a Christian way to, to convey respect for an old world tradition of virtue and his confidence in the power of a resolute human being to self-sculpt, to cut through the crust of adversity and liberate moral beauty. All in all, a work of courage. Well into the city of God, and so late into his struggle against Pelagianism, or really any form of Christian idealism, Augustine reaffirms his doctrine of radical grace and insists that the virtues, unless properly referred to God, are vices and not virtues, whatever the appearance. And yet who but God is in a position to guarantee the reference? There could be no doubt, late in the game, about what Augustine is assuming that virtuous self-sculpting falls under Christ's governance of the foreign city and so never happens, not even the tiniest bit of it, outside the work of grace. His broadly anti-Pelagian polemic, read alongside City of God, completes his critique of his secular antagonists. But now let's consider what happens to the mix of the two cities under a regime of radical grace. Imagine that I am a contemporary of Augustine's. I do this all the time. <laughs> An avowed Platonist, that's true. Not a Christian, that's false. Having much affected by Porphyry's polemic against that superstitious and anti-intellectual faith. But I do know of Christians who, much to my bemusement, share my love of Plato. And one of them, an acolyte of the renowned African rhetor and high priest, he cures for me a codex of book eight of his master's so-called confessions. I pause at the portrait there of Marius Victorinus, a great scholar and a reluctant convert. And when I get to the part where the high priest himself puts on Christ and feels embraced by a lux securitatus, a securing light, I find that I am inexplicably compelled by the notion that flesh is not the pathetic, soul-imprisoning stuff that I have been taking it to be. I begin to befriend the Christian plateness of my acquaintance, and within a year of my having read Blessed Augustine's words, I become an acolyte of Christ, the universal way to the Father that Porphyry was seeking, but refused to recognize. Now take a step back from this imagining. 
what have I, from a two cities perspective, just described? There are two possibilities. I have given you a false confession. I am not learning how to, go to love God to the point of self-contempt. I am one of those earthbound, dying city dwellers who is too narcissistic even to notice his own self-preoccupation. Or I have given you a true confession. I am one of those heaven-bound earthlings who feels ho at home neither here nor there. I am a foreigner, even to myself, as I move from a cramped and ultimately self-defeating self-love into a love that is limitless and yet somehow sustaining of selfhood. Let's say that my confession is true. It is absolutely not the case, given the ingress of grace, that I have changed my city address. I will always have been a member of the Kiwitas Dei Peregrina. And as the head of that city, Christ owns the rights even to my cramped and self-defeating self-love. Now suppose that my confession is false. Again, I have not, even for the barest of moments, changed my city address. My profession of the true faith, the faith that knows of the two cities, has been irredeemably superficial. It has done me no good at all. The point, of course, that I have been trying to dramatize with all the untethered speculation is that grace gives the lie to the kiwatatas per mixti. The two cities do not, in fact, mix. But I do not offer this point as a fixture in my reading of Augustine's political theology. Indeed, I would be reluctant to attribute to a thinker of his theological genius a form of theologizing that strikes me so plainly as theologically disastrous. Let's assume that Marcus is basically right when he reads Augustine to be holding fast in City of God to the invisibility of membership in either of the two cities. He is basically right. On this side of the eschaton, no one in Augustine's conception of the cyclum is in a position to know who is being saved, who is not. Nothing about that uncertainty, however, however, changes the fact that from God's superseding point of view, the determination has already been made. We may be waiting for history to end. God isn't. And if we attempt to base our political theology on an indeterminacy that is more imagined than real, we end up with a blind idealism. Here's a quick analogy. You and I are compelled by circumstance to live together. And we both know that one of us is irredeemably a psychopath. <laughs> Imagine some of you have been in relationships like that. <laughs> we just don't know which of us it is. Still faced with the task of living together, we look to one another for common interests and goals. And out of whatever commonality we find, we resolve to fashion the principles of conduct that will govern life in our tiny kibitas. Our mutually agreed upon political philosophy, though based on a kind of empirical research, will have utterly failed to take into account the material reality of our situation. One of us is irredeemably a psychopath. And that fact is going to trump a procedural idealism. But of course, I have set up the situation in such a way that the underlying material reality is both determinative and out of bounds. If I were to find myself a character in such a scenario, I think I would be less inclined to engage in philosophical dialectic than to seek a way to live on my own and cultivate whatever virtues my solitary mind would permit me. If I were forced to live in the company of another, I would encourage the presumption of a common condition of psychopathology and take my political prescriptions from there. The analog in Augustine for a commonly shared psychopathology is the condition of original sin a condition that renders a human being from birth onward incapable of resisting sin. Compulsive sinfulness is considerably worse than what most of us think of as garden variety selfishness. If I am driving my love of self into contempt for God, then I'm always looking down upon the very being 
that can give me the self I so desperately crave, something perfectly beautiful, beautiful, eternal, and mine. My psychological posture, and if it's not a pathology, what is, has me com committed to a self-aggrandizement of diminishing returns, where more is always less. What I really need is for God, the self-maker, to be looking down upon me and with benign condescension. For Augustine, such condescension necessarily takes the form of God's incarnation in Christ, who is the head and founder of only one of the two cities. Given for now that the two cities don't mix, other than in the minds of blinkered historical beings, we get the maddening scenario I just described, where you and I don't know who to trust, but we do know that we ought not to be trusting someone. <laughs> so much of this is politically realistic. <laughs> I try to avoid that sort of thing. Now add the theological cost to this way of thinking. Once Augustine has concluded early in his episcopate that nothing about a human being inclines God to favor one and not the other, he finds himself open to the wisdom of Ecclesiasticus. There we learn that human beings, being the stuff of earth, furnish clay for the heavenly potter's art. Some clay gets shaped into exalted and beloved vessels. Some gets cursed and cast aside. It's not up to clay to decide. Such is life. Paul adopts the metaphor of the potter and the clay in Romans 9, the chapter that revolutionizes Augustine's doctrine of election. Augustine reads both Paul and the writer of Ecclesiasticus to be saying that it is God's own good pleasure and nothing else that determines who out of a big heap of sin gets singled out and perfected. The emphasis that Augustine has slipped in on the unworthiness of clay to be potter's material need not divert us from the costly implication of his newfound wisdom. That materiality is being left out of the difference between the two cities. When Christ incarnates a Jesus of Nazareth and discloses the nature of God's foreign city on earth, he enters into a materiality that from a redemptive point of view so far has counted for nothing. He may as well stay at home with his father and will from there the redemption that comes ex nihilo. The usual theological complaint against Augustine's doctrine of radical grace is that it makes his God into too much of a perfectionist. There is nothing worth doing that this God does not insist on starting and finishing himself, leaving the human self sculptor reduced to a dumb lump of clay. The theological alternative that tends to accompany this kind of a complaint is to make God into an imperfectionist and grant to human free will its possibilities for virtue. But in his in-house debate with Pelagians and his across-the-aisle engagements with pagan intellectuals, Augustine has come to realize that imperfectionist gods, being content with the offerings of an imperfect love, leave perfectionist energies without a divine context. That makes it all the more likely that politics, the sacred domain of love of neighbor, will fall to lovers of dominion. And while it's not wrong for a citizen of either of the two cities to crave a self that is unique, it is only by way of a materially qualified perfectionism that the desire for uniqueness, or more basically the desire for unity, um, avoids having to idealize matter. By materially qualified, I do not mean a perfection that is less than ideal. Nor do I mean a perfectionism that is relative to the ideal something more. The one is false, the other impossible. I mean perfectionism with a difference. God's city remains as it has always been and will always be something perfect, but its mixture with its counterpart, the imperfect city, needs to be seen as having more reality than the ghost of a limited perspective. I owe to Augustine my profoundest sense 
of the dangers of idealization in religion, of rendering differences absolute, if only by way of deferral. Of course, I readily admit that there are secular analogs for subliming logic, and that there is nothing inextricably religious about the idealizing temptation. Still, I take Augustine to be an idealizer. I also take him to be an inspired subverter of his own idealizations. And what I've had to say thus far, I have hewed my thoughts mostly to accord with his idealizing side. Now I would like to attend more closely to the subverter. I find this the more gratifying and also the more vexing labor. It's easy enough to blame the potter for his blatant disregard of clay. The condemnation is always the shadow side of an idealizing energy. The subtler alternative, more like stillness than not, is to meditate on clay and wait for the unexploitable differences to emerge. So let's begin with angels. In a groundbreaking, soon to be published essay on the nature of a kiwatas in De Kiwatate Dei, my friend and colleague from Bryn Mawr College, Catherine Conabare, has, obser has observed that it is, and I quote, built into Augustine's notion of a kiwatas that it will be the product of division. The angels tell the story here. In their apocalyptic split into demons and first citizens of heaven, or as I would be inclined to put it, into perfect and perfection-seeking beings, the angels pretend the divisiveness that will define the human experience of a kiwatas. For there are, in Augustine's mind, fundamentally two cities and not four. The perfect angels and the predestined saints make up the one, the ragingly imperfect counterparts, darkly angelic and darkly human, make up the other. It is not absurd, Augustine insists, to posit a fellowship between human beings and angels. For without it, or something of its sort, division within a mixed community never abates. And angels and human beings together are certainly a mixed bag. Even in their demonic form and confined to the air of the lowest heaven, angels are not creatures of the earth. And human beings, for their part, are always earthly. Even the ones in hell <coughs> fall within reach of the earth-born God. Each of the two cities, then, is a mixed bag of natures, fleshly and fleshless, but also a distinctive unity of will. Angels and saints in chorus will the good for God's sake. Demons and their human minions work publicly for worldly glory, were privately serving the good of their separate and endlessly dissipating selves, for theirs is the unity of a common lie. Opposing orientations of will, one true, the other false, is what counts for Augustine as the defining difference between the two mixed-natured cities, both angelic and human, but as different as day and night. But here's the problem. As important as the differential will has been to Augustinian theology, it sheds no retrospective light on the liability to division that Catherine rightly puts at the heart of Augustine's notion of acuitas. So far, we have been getting from him a heavenly city that has no such liability and an earthly city that is divisiveness itself. This is all idealization. We need to move within his thought to a less decipherable form of division. The first place to be is with the angels prior to the angelic fall and the invention of heaven and hell. Although Augustine doesn't have nearly as much to say as a Dante or a Milton will about the prequel to the drama in Eden, what he does say is rich in significance. For many centuries, his angelic muse has been fueling the Christian imagination for life in between heaven and hell, a space that is, from an idealizing point of view, beyond conception. Angels see the, Augustine sees the angels coming to be, and then in an eye blink, falling apart, in less than a time it takes to read two short verses from the priestly account of creation. First, Genesis 1, 3. Let there be light, and there was light. 
it is with the light, Augustine assumes, that the angels first emerge. They are the light. Or more precisely, they are the light's communicability, being inseparable in their way of being from a call to illumination. In their fellowship with God and with one another, the angels convey the perfect intelligibility of a shared wisdom, or love by another name. In this regard, they are the least private of all God's creatures. They are kiwitas itself. But now Genesis 1-4. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. The rending of angelic being into angels who remain in community and the ones who bend into a self and fall apart has already happened. As Augustine reads the verse, God's dividing of light from darkness is a judgment, not an initiative. All the initiative for division has come from the peculiar angelic beings whose meshes of light is darkness. The creator sees the original light, sees that it is good, calls it day of the next verse, and refrains from looking approvingly at the gathering of darkness to which he gives the name night. For Augustine, the omission of explicit approval is damning enough. This particular night is never going to see the light of day again. If an angel turns from God, then that angel, Augustine writes, becomes impure. And is the case with all impure spirits, fallen angels are no longer, as Augustine puts it, echoing Ephesians 5.8, the light that is in the Lord. They are the darkness that is in themselves. Evil being nothing more to Augustine, but also nothing less than a loss of goodness, he is willing to read evil into that first and eternal night. What strikes me most about Augustine's exegesis, which is almost wholly a reading between the lines, is its misplaced pathos. If angels are essentially social beings, and with a sociology, sociality that is far more encompassing and profound than the comparatively human and puny experience of it, then how must the survivors have felt when they began to realize they would be losing so much of their kibitas to an irrevocable darkness. They will have fallen apart no less grievously than their self-defeating counterparts, and arguably more so. For part of what comes with the, with the darkening of the light is decreased self-awareness and loss of the capacity to feel compassion for others. Their surviving angels are left to bear the suffering that the fallen angels, eternally dying to themselves, can no longer feel. It is only in heaven that nightfall stings. Now, there's nothing about this speculation of mine that would have been beyond Augustine's capacity to imagine. Indeed, he's rather better at this sort of thing than I am. And for that and much else, I have been grateful to be his student. But in this case, he is more unwilling than incapable of reading further between the lines. He bolsters his unwillingness in two closely related ways. He emphasizes just how unangelic the demons are, especially Lucifer, who is given light bearing a bad name. Sorry. <laughs> he insists, with the weight of a tradition as witness, that real angels just know that no demons will ever again emerge from their ranks. The psychological defensiveness behind this exegetical strategy is not hard to fathom. When faced with the soul-rending task of having to mourn an enemy, think of surviving as vindication and substitute anger for grief. This is a psychology that moves Aeneas from Carthage to Rome and earns for Cain a life of rootless wandering. I trust it's understood that when I unearth defensiveness in Augustine's reading of angelic life, my intent is neither to make light of the demonism that can render a once luminous life unrecognizable, nor to criticize Augustine for a lack of sympathy. 
if someone of his sensitivity can be tempted to turn a wounded kibitas into an occasion for putting angels and demons firmly into their respective places, then the pain that demands the idealization must be very great indeed. The thing to notice is not that Augustine gives in to it, but that he does not give in completely. He leaves at least one form of the division between angels indeterminately divisive. I refer to his speculation, most fully set out in the City of God 1113, about what disposes one angel but not another to leave heaven's embrace. One possibility, he suggests, is that tempted angels lack self-knowledge. They experience being happy with God and their fellow angels, but they do not know who they are in all this bliss. Fearing that their bliss lacks substance, they leave the heavenly city in search of themselves. They seek self-knowledge. The problem with this possibility is its apparent unfairness. All angels must submit to the same divine law, but the perfect angels already have what the imperfect angels must perpetually seek. The other possibility, emphasizing equity, has all the angels beginning without self-knowledge. Some of them not content to wait for it, break out on their own, the others seeing the result of that one, stand fast. Augustine decides not to decide. This remains, he writes, that either the angels were unequal, or if equal, that the good ones came to a solid knowledge of their own everlasting bliss after the ruin of the rest. Augustine's indecisiveness here is more important and less exotic than it may at first appear to be. Let's vi revisit the possibilities he feels he must hold together, though they hardly seem to him to cohere. In the Kiwatas of the unequal angels, we almost have a city of God of mixed composition that does not require a shadow city to define it. I say almost because Augustine seems to be assuming that imperfection in this city is the mark of ruin. On that reading, the imperfect angels have never really been in communion with the perfection that they seek. Their exit from heaven is simply the confirmation of a pre-existing condition. With the other possibility, the kibitas of equal angels, imperfection is clearly not the mark of ruin. Some imperfect angels fall, some refrain from falling and find perfection. But this city does seem to require a shadow city for its proper definition. Angels who look for perfection among equals find it through angels who are no longer equal and who, in fact, have never been equal. For in keeping with their externally defined perfection, perfect angels are always looking down on what is eternally foreign to them. Each of the two cities that Augustine has imagined has to outsource its internal differences to an idealization that undoes them. His unwillingness, his, I'm sorry, his willingness to hold two as one in absence of a perfect union speaks to his desire for a real kibitas, a place where difference is still knowable. That is why his indecisive, indecisiveness is in this case important. When I speak of his indecisiveness as being less exotic than it may seem, I mean to imply that Augustine's puzzlement over angels is not fundamentally over the ground plans for an angelopolis. He begins Stadia of God 1113, which I have been reading thus far as a chapter about angelic difference, with the pronouncement about the bliss of a perfectly intellectual form of life. He is in no doubt about the truth of what he is claiming. It is not difficult for it to occur to anyone, he writes, that an intellectual nature single-mindedly desires the bliss that comes of this conjunction, that it is enjoying trouble-free the changeless good that is God, and that it is remaining forever in that enjoyment, hindered by no doubt and deceived by no error. The first condition of bliss is a condition of being. You cannot be happy merely by believing that you are happy. You have to really be happy. The second condition of bliss is a condition of knowing. You cannot be happy and not know that you are. 
For an intellectual nature, or a being that is its knowing, the two conditions are inseparable, identical in fact. The being whose enjoyment lasts knows itself to be a lasting being, living beyond the touch of time. But who is this being that Augustine is describing? The word he uses to characterize this manner of desire, desiderat, strongly connotes desire for what has yet to be possessed. If Augustine intends the connotation, and I believe he does, then he is describing a perfection-seeking being, but not a perfect one. Within the context of City of God 1113, that condition would have to denote either an angel about the fall, or more tentatively, any of the angels prior to the angelic fall. I don't think that Augustine can be right about this. What he is claiming violates the logic of perfection. If angels begin their careers as imperfect beings, then they are not purely intellectual beings, and they never will be. If they begin as perfect beings, then they are purely intellectual beings, and they have no time for a fall, and so they don't. The operative principle here, a metaphysical one, is this. Originally perfect, always perfect. I take it that what Augustine is really describing in City of God 1113 is not two possibilities for an original city of angels, one a mixture of imperfect and imperfect beings, the other an undifferentiated mass of perfection seekers, but the two human cities, Peregrina and Terena. With the angelic veil partially lifted, let's look again at these two and do the math. When is one plus another still one? The indeterminacy that has kept Augustine's hypothetically angelic cities shaded together plays directly into the figure of his Adam, who in his infallen condition is a corpus per mixtum. Corpus per mixtum is the term that Augustine uses to refer to the historical church as an unsorted body of the saved and the damned. He never thinks to apply it to Adam, but just wait. Eden, as Augustine conceives of it, is a material and social paradise where psychologically well-adjusted people are given a chance to couple, raise children, and commune with God. It is also a place of great spiritual opportunity. If you refrain from taking fruit from the tree of knowledge and keep at the family life, you will one day discover that you no longer need to eat from the tree of life to stave off aging and death. Your vision of God perfectly sustains you, but by then, of course, your flesh will have undergone a considerable upgrade. What I have described is doubtless a place of wonder, but Eden is not perfection. We know this because Adam himself, who was a part of the place, is not perfect. He lacks the essential ingredients of perfect being. He does not begin his life knowing that he will forever be enjoying God, and not knowing this, the enjoyment that he does have is necessarily incomplete and open to doubt. Adam's imperfection leaves him with selfhood that is less than ideal. But does, does it also mark him for the terrena kibitas, where amor sui, love of self, always spells ruin? Augustine thinks not. He conceives of Adam as beginning with the important, if limited, freedom of being able not to sin, posa non peccara. And yet it is precisely in that regard that Adam is bizarrely unrepresentative, a citizen without a city. His city heirs, without exception, have been one of two types. There are the earthers, who cannot help but sin. Their experience of their own imperfection propels them from one partial vision of the self to the next with no wholeness in sight. And then there are the heavenists, who are invisibly claimed by perfection the power that is beyond sin's domain. Their experience of themselves is still one of imperfection, but for some reason and only to God, imperfection is not writing their stories. Augustine's ideal of a corpus per mixtum is basically the idea that imperfection signifies neither the absence of perfection nor its impossibility. In that sense, Adam, no less than the historical church, 
conveys the idea. Adam conveys it through the indeterminacy of his freedom. The church conveys it through its mixing of hidden determinacies. But it must be conceded that a failure to signify is not in itself a mode of signification. Left to negotiate an insignificant mix of materiality, Augustine's brand of politics, like anyone else's, will become earthly by default. Then it is all more or less a game of imposition. When Marcus attempts to make a political virtue out of the invisibility of the Kiwitas Peregrina, the godly but foreign city, he gets criticized by a number of astute theologians for secularizing Augustine's theology and blunting the church's critique of the world. One of that number, John Milbank, the mover of radical orthodoxy, has been particularly uninterested in church and world detente. Here is the essence of what he has had to say about the earthly city. For the ends sought by the Kivitas Terena are not merely limited finite goods. They are those finite goods regarded without referral to the infinite good. And in consequence, they are unconditionally bad ends. The realm of the merely practical, cut off from the ecclesial, is quite simply a realm of sin. Milvank's provocative assimilation of worldliness to sin catches the attention of Marcus, who responds to Milbank and other anti-secularists in his last major reconsideration of Augustinian secularity, his blessed Pope John XXIII lectures. Basically, Marcus faults Milbank for failing to distinguish between two senses of the earthly city. As strictly a collection of arrogant and selfish individuals having no hope of becoming anything else, and in the extended sense, as a community defined by a less determinative form of self-interest. In a parenthetical aside, Marcus concedes that Augustine favors the strict sense whenever he is bothering to define things. But the strict sense, insists Marcus, is never exclusive. If I labor this point, he writes, it is because it's critically important to bear in mind that empirical groups institutions and societies are, for Augustine, always and necessarily composites of the two cities taken in their strict eschatological meaning. The nature of the composite that Marcus has in mind is more purely secular than a mix of heaven and earth would seem to suggest. With Augustine's blessing presumed, Marcus opts to double down on the terrena kibitas. His bet is that a corpus permixtum composed of pretenders to virtue and the truly graced can come to a limited but valuable consensus, the basis of an earthly peace, without having to settle accounts with all the pretense, which in intermediate times would be impossible to do in any case. But since it's the earthly city that is getting most of the release time from its, quote, strict eschatological meaning, Marcus ends up assimilating most of the church, that other corpus permixtum, to the world. The part left over is purely a symbolic power called to interject humility and a dose of prophetic clarity into murky negotiations of worldly power. Bob Dodaro, who best knows the pulse of post-Marcus Augustinianism, has brilliantly characterized the difference between Marcus and Milbanks in terms of antithetical emphases. Milbank and Marcus turn out to be the bookends of Augustine's political theology. For while Milbank showcases the church as Corpus Christi and tends to sideline the body part that is more worldly, Marcus underscores the church's unworldliness and appears content to reduce his claim to Corpus Christi to mere signage. Bob himself prefers to inhabit the place in the middle, which is less a fixed center than a constant dodging of, ex of extremes. In Augustine's thought, he writes, Corpus Christi and Ecclesia Permixta interpenetrate one another in time with the consequence that it is only in its final complete form that Augustine considers the church to be a truly just society. Bob is the sanest ecclesiologist that I know. But tonight, I have been lingering with the original angels, the first Adam, and God's foreign city on earth to make the case for one not-so-simple lesson. 
that material difference escapes eschatological analysis. And thank God for that. When I speak of material difference, I speak of the difference that keeps the conjunction between perfection and perfection seeking from defaulting to antithesis. I speak of the difference that puts prodigal saints and unerring angels into the same kibitas. I speak of the difference between an idealized kibitas and a real one. Eschatology is a form of idealization. Specifically, it is the idealization of time. It looks to time at the end of history, not the last moment of time, but its fulfillment, the perfection. The problem for eschatology is that time is never ideal. It is just not that kind of a creature. Whenever the Kiwatas Dei Peregrina is made to fit an idealized end of time, it segments along the lines of an untenable conjunction. On the one side, there is perfection-seeking absent all perfection. That is the eschatologist's hell. Its politics are those of the earthly city. On the other side, there is perfection absent all seeking. That's heaven, which sounds nicer, but bear in mind that no one who has had to seek the place ever really enters. This particular paradise is a tomb for memory. In those relatively rare places in his theologizing where we find Augustine collapsing saints into angels and sinners into demons, we are witnessing the effects of an overheated eschatology. Now, I'm not claiming that eschatology is a bad thing. On the contrary, I believe that it is an essential ingredient of Augustine's theology, of Christian theology in general, of redemption itself. We live, we die, we live again. When we aim to speak of the mysteries of birth, death, and resurrection, but deny ourselves the use of eschatological categories, we end up describing the ups and downs of a self-imposed perfectionism. So again, I am not claiming that eschatology is a bad thing. My claim is only that eschatology requires for its proper office an irreducibly material context. I have been wanting throughout my lecture to distinguish imperfectionism, which for me is synonymous with the politics of the earthly city, from perfectionism with a difference. I will conclude my thoughts about a tangle of two cities with a brief and imperfect meditation on what that difference is. This may be where Christianity and Platonism definitively part company. Compare two ways of thinking about God. Here is the first. Think of perfection not as a condition of being, as an achievement of some sort, but as being itself. When perfection is a condition of being, I can sensibly speak of something being more or less perfect. The aim of a mixed kibitas is that of a more perfect union. But we earthers know how that one can go. Perfection as being itself always is what it is and never is anything else. Let's call this perfection God. God does not have a past. There is never a time when perfection as being is no longer. What is no longer does not exist. And being, if it is anything, is not nothing. Using the same reasoning, we can see that God does not have a future. There is never a time when perfection is not yet. The future, like the past, lacks being, lacks the perfect, lacks God. You and I, for whom perfection is a condition of being, are deeply invested in having a past and a future. Those two compelling bits of nothingness, the no longer and the not yet, orient us to a self-knowledge, the lack of which makes life with the perfect God unlivable. So much for Eden. We're not going back. Here's the other way to think about God. Keep the same logic of perfection. God is still the perfect being, and as such, God is eternal and not time-defined. But now add this supposition. Perfection has incarnated, taken on human form, and lived out the life and death of one perfection seeker in particular, that of Jesus of Nazareth, whom Christians call Christ, the Son of God. 
Christ, for the Christian Augustine, heads God's city in heaven and on earth and discloses the nature of the perfection that is divine, but with a difference. So what's the difference? God has not changed. I have stipulated, in conformity with Platonist metaphysics and Christian dogma, that God is the perfect being, or in short, that God is. When Christians speak of God becoming human, they do not mean to imply that God, in becoming human, ceases to be God, but so as not to be speaking for all Christians, some of whom may be Protestant theologians. I will simply say that this is surely Augustine's view of the matter, however much I may lapse, as I doubtless do, into speaking for him. Granting that God remains perfectly God while incarnate, the alternative way of thinking about God must engage with God's humanity. If this humanness somehow admits of perfection, then we have our perfection with the difference. Before venturing into that hesitant conditional, I need to spend a moment with a hypothetical Platonist, one not so interested in my Christian piety. This Platonist would like me to see that when I was just speaking about the non-being of the past and future, I was availing myself, and necessarily so, of the language of being. To say that the past is no longer is still to say that the past is that it exists. The same goes for the future. The future is not yet, and there it is. Perfection, my Platonist reminds me, is eternally open to the imperfect. It is the condition of its possibility. If I am thinking about imperfection at all, I have already called to mind the perfection that makes imperfection conceivable. But now comes the part that my Platonist is most anxious for me to take in. Just as I can father my son, but my son cannot father me, the imperfect can come of the perfect, but it can never fully return there. Imperfect being, the child of time and eternity, is eternally of the father and eternally apart. My hypothetical Platonist is not quite as hypothetical as I have been making him out to be. I have drawn him directly from Book 11 of Augustine's Confessions where Augustine meditates on the eternal origin of all things and confesses that when he thinks about it, he does not know what time is. As he presses his thinking on the matter, he comes to two important conclusions, both absolutely crucial to a sense of God. One is that he would have no recollection, not even enough to be confused about time, were it not for the presence of eternity in every moment. The eternal turns his finite mind, otherwise subject to constant distraction, into a collector of time. Once in his mind's grasp, the present ceases to be just the infinitesimal sliver of being that divides the not yet from the no longer. It becomes as well the nub of memory, attention, and expectation, the coordination of which is recollection. Augustine begins to recollect that he craves for more satisfaction than a life of distraction can possibly offer him. He wants the peace of God, perfection itself. But his other insight into the conjunction between time and eternity shapes this desire for, of his even more profoundly than the first. Augustine is quite aware throughout his confession that his mind's manner of grasping time does not exempt him from dissolution. Time exceeds and eventually overwhelms its container. Augustine concludes from this that if God is beyond time, as the perfect being must be, then God is not time's container. The, Augustine's, uh, the Augustine of Confessions 11, the confessor of time, comes closest in understanding to conceding the Platonist's complaint against all eschatology, that it tries to imagine perfect imperfection. It is surely no accident that we humans lack a good sense of what a perfected human being, resurrected and freed from further death, is supposed to look like. Is he old, young, tall, short, slim, hefty, or always mid-30s with a finely cropped beard, longest chestnut hair, sensitive eyes and hands like butter? <laughs> Is he sometimes a she? Or perhaps a tertium quid, 
a male and female blend, or a beauty without gender. The Platonist in Augustine will tell us to stop imagining. In his sermon on Psalm 86, the psalm that sings of Augustine's glorious city, Augustine cautions his congregation not to extrapolate from their closing. I simply want to suggest that Augustine's true genius for eschatology not, lies not in his speculations bordering on the, on the bizarre about the look of resurrected flesh, it lies in his thinking about sacrifice. The kibitas peregrina, he insists, is itself one big sacrifice made acceptable to God per sacerdotum magnum by way of the great priest. Think of that priest consecrating the host. He will not break what is not first broken in himself. Christ's human relation to perfection is perfect because his self-sacrifice to God is perfect. He holds back nothing, and in that sense, he ceases to relate. As he tells us in the Gospel of John, the Father and I are one. But if Christ is one with God, it is because God is first one with him. Perfection that eternally conjoins itself to the imperfect is letting go and not just giving up. Here is the beginning of the difference between love and deprivation. But what of the rest of us strangers who are the grasping limbs of a foreign city and not its head? Perhaps it comes as no surprise that a person of my mixed pieties, Platonist and Christian, looks to love for the difference that perfection makes. I confess that I have found no vindication there. Christianity is a religion for the brokenhearted. Augustine is confident that the saints in heaven will remember their brokenness, but without the pain of recognition. Meanwhile, Christ waits and grieves for those who choose to live within too guarded a knowing. In between consolations of heaven and hell, there is an awakening. The city that has seemed so familiar unveils itself as foreign. Each of us wakes up at first light to see the stranger. Thank you. In time for questions, I think it's wise to pause for a moment for people who think that they do need to leave. I'll take questions if you're not expecting too much in the way of an answer. Excellent. Yes, John. Jim, thanks. That was um, wonderful in all sorts of ways. Is it, is it an apocalyptic that Augustine has that is, serves as the balm to the eschatological idealism or something else? Um, Say a little bit about what you mean by the difference between apocalyptic and well, eschatological. I mean, I take it you're, you, you've developed a certain kind of Christology as the balm. It's generous. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As a certain kind. Yeah. Um, and I take it as an inbreaking of a kind. Yeah. And I guess I guess I'm wondering is the inbreaking um, only once? Uh, or is there is his account of grace? Does it provide something in that materiality that we're after that will, as I say, be a bomb to that idealistic? I mean, is the inbreaking only once? Um, that to me is a question of what it means to share within the perfection of Christ. Um, and I, I'm evading your question a little bit because I don't really know how to answer it. So that's the honest question. I mean, my sense, my, my inclination is to say the answer is is yes and no. I mean, there's a sense in which it does break in only once because resurrection isn't a repetition of the life that went before. Uh, it, it happens all the time in the sense that our life isn't really confined in the ways that seems, it seems to be on this side of a certain kind of perfection. Which is also evident in the 
continuity between Abel and the last of the elect to be the man. said they must feel that way about their comrades who fell. Um, so how, I would just like to hear you say more about how one can maintain a broken heartedness, not only of one's own imperfection, about one's own imperfections, but about the loss of the other, the, the dark others that you can no longer get back. Right. Yeah. Um, I guess two, two things there. Augustine's angelology has, has fascinated me for, for years. And, and I did a, a bit of an exegetical backhand. I, I, I basically claimed at the end of the day he hasn't been talking about angels, which I suppose is an arrogant as to claim that he, that for him to claim that he has been talking about angels. Um, it just strikes me that the dynamic he's talking about in terms of, of how the, the angelic fall happens which he does offer as a speculation, he's not offering it as some kind of you know, you know, dogmatic pronouncement, bears more to me on the dynamics he's been describing as, <coughs> as human. Now, so I, I honestly don't, um, if, if you really press me on angelology, and you should do that much later if you want to do that, um, I, I'm not inclined to attribute things like brokenheartedness to angels. Um, for human beings, it's important, I, I mean, part of what I, 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 I've been, I struggle with both as a scholar and as you know, somebody who, who has taken in these traditions, Platonist and Christian, and in, in more existential ways, is really what's the difference between a platonic aspiration for perfection and following the command, be ye perfect as your Father is in heaven. And um, when I say that Christianity at the end is a religion for, a broken hearted, for, for the broken hearted, what I mean is that the, that the ego, <laughs> the self that you're, that you're given from God and that you return it as a kind of sacrifice isn't an illusory self. It's real. There are some versions of Platonism, and I'm not going to subscribe, I'm not going to say this is Plotinus or, or Plato, but there's some versions of Platonism where you get the idea that the self that we identify with as bodily is, yeah, it's not exactly unreal, but it's not that real. It's kind of shadowy stuff. And so as we, as it, as we get more of a perception of what reality is, the self kind of fades away, the way that the sun uh, dispels the mist. I think in the way that Augustine is thinking through his relationship to that tradition, which powerfully has shaped his conception of God, um, no. <laughs> uh, the the you know, imperfect loves are absolutely real. And to feel them offered is to feel the pain uh, of having an essential connection broken. So there's a place for, and this is really true in terms of if you, if you read uh, you know, the confessions, you know, in contrasting to, well, not just Platonism, but for most of the, uh, the non-Christian philosophy of the time, and, and a lot of the Christian philosophy as well, there is a place for grief within the philosophical life within Augustine that's hard to find a comparable place. In, uh, in much of the Platonist tradition that he draws from. So it becomes a kind of a, something you don't have joy, but it is, but there is, a, the possibilities of joy are tied up with the possibilities of, of brokenheartedness. Jim, thank you. I know it's difficult to look back at history and say what if, but in your own uh, 
out of speculation. What if the sack of Rome never took place? <laughs> Would Augustine have come up with this city of God? Well, I mean, I, I really tend to go with the view, and it's not, um, it's not an unpopular one, that his thinking about the two cities really predated the, the, the sack of Rome. And I don't know that we would have gotten the city of God in quite, I don't know if we've gotten the, the, the first 10 books of look how screwed up Platonism, I mean, look how screwed up paganism is. But we would have gotten, I, I, no question in my mind, we would have gotten still a very profound meditation on what the two cities are. The, I think if you want to play the what if questions, and they're like Augustine's favorite questions, so you know, how can I not play with it? Um, I'm not sure that he would have given us, actually I'll put it this way, I'm fairly convinced that whatever city of God he would have given us wouldn't have so tortured the modern imagination of what political theology is. Because it's the overlay of a polemic of, you know, we all know, we all, we don't know what the end is, but frankly, our side's better than yours and your side kind of sucks. With this sort of complicated, deep, uh, exegetically, philosophically profound meditation on these two cities, which I think at times is incoherent, and it, but that doesn't, necessarily, that doesn't mean necessarily a bad thing. And then we're thinking, you know, how does this, you know, we have such a hard time, this is gross understatement here, coordinating our spiritual lives with our political lives. That that part, that tortured part of us resonates with this text. Because in that respect, it is itself a tortured text. That I don't think we would have had. Unless there was some provocation that, ha that would have driven Augustine to attach to the City of God meditation a really long polemic against his religious opponents. Yeah, thank you for that. My question is more a question of clarification. I'm sort of reading the essay so I can grasp it. I really don't know if I understood something. On Augustine and eschatology, <clears throat> I thought I heard you saying it's either very difficult or impossible to go from imperfect to perfect. Are you yeah. suggesting there's a fundamental difficulty or incoherence? Yeah. Okay. His question: What if it hadn't been a um, set? What if it hadn't been a fall? Is it possible that, that this built into creation? Yeah. There's an eschatological reality. In other words, creation yeah. was always meant to go somewhere. Yeah. And whether fall or not, it was always meant to develop. Right. Um, so can you just maybe help me? I'm going to try to show what you're saying, first of all. Yeah, no, I, what you're, you're, I was saying as a matter of, a, a, I, I, I called it a metaphysical principle. That, you know, well, original per, originally perfect, always perfect. Color would be, you know, ever imperfect, always imperfect. Now, that color, I think, is true but you have to modify it when you start taking into account how he uses the, how he meditates upon the humanity of Christ in relationship to God. So it's, it's not quite as simple a question. But two things in terms of what you're asking. You know, first of all, just in terms of simply how Augustine was understanding the Genesis story. He absolutely thought that had Adam not fallen, and again, he, he likes to think these things through counterfactually, um, what would have happened is Adam and uh, Eve, the man and the woman, would have had, uh, they would have had sex. Uh, it would have been a kind of perfect, mutually uh, communicative experience. And they would have populated the earth with the number of saints that would replace the number of angels lost. So this is a kind of is so it put into place is a kind of let's perfect something that's imperfect. And at the moment when that restoration of numbers had happened, there would have been a, a transfiguration in human flesh. And the way that Augustine, uh, Augustine has a terrifically material imagination. Adam in, e, in the garden actually is not as different. <laughs> from human beings outside of the garden, as he often makes it seem, and he starts emphasizing sort of the metaphysics of will. Adam had to eat to live. And the only reason why he wasn't dying 
is he had access to a particularly miraculous food, the tree of life. So he is subject to aging not because his nature is somehow changed to, to, to moral. He was always moral. Is he no longer can, ha can have the stuff that'll keep him from dying? So the transfiguration that Augustine's imagining is we'll cease at some point to experience our life as external to us. The principle of life will feel like, well, it's just who we are. It's part of who we are. And that's essentially his picture of angelic beings. So his vision is that had the garden stuff gone better than it did, we would have more or less angelized in our nature. Um, I guess what, what, I, what I'm willing to, what I, what I want to say is um, that's a lovely story, but it doesn't make metaphysical sense. That you're not, move, you're not moving to, from a condition of imperfection to perfection. Why not? Because if, you're be, if your mode of being is defined by time, then the only perfection you can really imagine is to um, transcend time. What I, I'll, a good deal of eschatological thought doesn't, though, keep in mind is you can't transcend time without actually muti mutilating a lot of your being. And so I, I said, part of what I said in the paper towards the end is it's just not an accident. We say, well, think of what a human, perfect human life would look like. None of us has an ideal that we can't gently pull apart and transcend because there is no picture of what it would look like to be a perfected life in time. So in that sense, I, 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 am, I, am, say, I am arguing against him, but there, there's also a, a part of his thinking where he's on that side. And I, I, one of the things that occurred to me when I was doing the paper, uh, and I realized I had been doing this too, there's a huge conceptual difference between the end of time and eternity. And if they're not sorted out, it, you know, I, I think what happens with Augustine is readers of Augustine tend to make the eschatology do way more work than it can. And that's particularly true of the city of God. Where Marcus, who's a, you know, he, uh, Marcus uh, died about a year and a half ago, Marvelous man. It's an amazing book, you know, Cyculum. It's just an amazing, lovely book. But really, what he does in coming up with this really humane religious politics is he pushes the eschatological categories as far as they can go. And although I'm entirely sympathetic to the religious vision, he still ends up having to base his politics on what he knows is an illusion. And I think once you do, I think as, 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 as liberal as I am in my political sensibilities, I don't think you can base your politics on an illusion. And that ultimately is what the mixture of the cities ends up being if the only framework for talking about it is eschatological. The other thing that's inconvenient about that is with only the eschatological framework, Christ has no materiality to incarnate into because the material has already been divided up into the perfectly saved and the perfectly imperfect damned. So there, there's no, the, the only way you can, you can think of Christ, well, I, it's really hard to imagine Christ being other than an illustration of an abstract platonic truth. He'll incarnate into the body to show you how useless the body is, and I'll go ahead and try to be fleshless. But that's not Augustine's view of the matter. So part of what I'm trying to get at is, well, what's the materiality that makes the mediation of Christ central? What's the materiality that actually keeps the, the, the two human beings, the two human cities together? And, you know, it's there, but in the city of God, the eschatology, I think, is, is mainly the, the predominant emphasis. Yeah, Professor, I, I found your... Um exposition just on Augustine's perspective on um, light, and especially how you picked up that um, in the Bible, God doesn't necessarily say that darkness is good. He just omits it completely. I found that was really profound. Right. Um, well, that's, that's Augustine. I have to give him 
Well, most of them have left. <laughs> so, I've so, I've already, so I've already failed, but um, you, you, you can be the prophet. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if I can give you a list of three, uh, though I will think about it, and I will give you a list of three, just maybe not in the next 30 seconds. But I will tell you one, my experience of writing this paper as the, uh, as the Democratic and the Republican conventions are going on, <laughs> and is it, I've been thinking like, damn, I mean, it's just like, uh, uh, we have a very limited religious language in this country for talking about uh, kibitas per mixti, the mixed cities. And I mean, in here, and he, again, here's I, I, why I want to, 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 to give a bit more homage to Robert Marcus. Because although I, I don't think the eschatology can do as much as he, he wanted it to do, one of the things that was really so intriguing about his book is he gave, he gave his readers a religious basis for secularity, a religious basis for one. Now, Given how demoralized liberalism has become and how religious discourse, political, politicized religious discourse, has been increasingly fascinated with the fallenness of others, we damn well need a religious way of thinking about secularity. There is, I think, um, Little, it's okay. Uh, it's just, it's just humming. It'll stop. Um, you don't have to take apart the room. Uh, I don't think that Augustine. I, look, my, I don't, I don't go to the ancient world for answers to contemporary problems. What I go to the ancient world for is, how can I expand my range of conceptual sensitivities so I can see more than what my culture fairly unconsciously. In its, in, its, in its difficulties is having trouble thinking through. I mean, one of the parts I said, I said you know, when I said, when I was criticizing Augustine, I wasn't criticizing, I was just playing this game of, you know, if I were imagining the angelic fall, I would imagine the angels really being brokenhearted. We live in a culture where we don't see people in prison as a rended part of our kiwatas. We don't see them as brothers and sisters that we're alienated from. We see them as, like, thank God we got those scary people out of the way. More and more in political discourse, we don't see the other side you know, of the aisle and the intractability is this is a wound in the body politic. It's more a sense of this is the occasion for a further idealization you know, of differences. Um, I, you know, I, I think Augustine is really a tremendous resource for, and I think this is really a crying cultural need. I don't care what you're, where you're coming from in terms of your particular religious confession. We need more theologically literate citizens. All right. So um, we'll get them back at some point. But, uh, but, but that's, that's, in, that's basically along the lines of the answer. I mean, I do actually think about practical things every once in a while, although generally I try to avoid it. Yes? Sermon from, from the Dalbo collection, and it, 
there's a kind of a, this extensive yeah. sort of critique of, of the paper. So it seems like over the course of his um, pastoral career, this gulf is widening. Yeah. And so um, I'm wondering if, if you have any thoughts about kind of how the trajectory uh, of Augustine's thought relates to the kinds of things that he's dealing with in ministry and any reflections on it. Well, if I understand what you're, you're observing, and, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, as, as he moves more and more into the responsibilities of being a bishop and a pastor, uh, it's, it's, he's, he, he seems to be uh, less taken you know, with the metaphysical speculations of Platonism and, and more involved with you know, repairing relationships uh, within his community, within his church. Uh, I mean, I, is that? Yeah, but then also kind of like dealing with Platonists that so sort of, yeah. you know, he's encountering, he's having to sort of like, it's more than just sort of saying, hey, we've got common ground, oh, yeah. come join us. And they're saying, no, yeah. It, yes. why should I? Is kind of what he's. Yeah, no, and you see this, and he definitely, I mean, part of what happens, um, and, and John Riss makes a big point of this in, in his long kind of study of Augustine's thought, ancient thought, baptized. Um, in the city of God, which this course ranges over the, you know, the last couple of decades of his life, um, he, he'll, he'll say things on the one hand like, you know, there's just nobody closer to Christians than Platonist philosophers and they essentially have the right conception of God. Um, and I think he means that seriously, but then I think what becomes more complicated for him is it becomes, it becomes less and less an incidental matter <laughs> that that conception of God isn't connected with his sense of mediation through, through Christ, right? And partly that has to do, this was Riss's point, is that when um, Porphyry started, when he discovered that you know, not all Platonists are, 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 are neutral about Christianity or just ready to hop on board, uh, one of Plotinus' chief disciples not only knew about Christianity but knew well enough to say, this isn't going to work, this is a disaster. Uh, and then combine that with the fact that he's, he no longer has the leisure of um, not being heard as a church authority. I mean, Rowan Williams pointed this out. You know, once you're Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, what you could do as a professor at Oxford is a, that's another world. You know? So I think there's a kind of, there is a kind of pastoral concern where he's, a he's more wary of being you know, overtly enthusiastic. Um, I think his relationship with Platonism uh, I mean, to say the least, is complicated. And, and to my mind, he never breaks with it. He doesn't break with it fully because Platonism gives him, a, gives him his imagination, his philosophical repertoire for thinking of perfection. And although I pushed uh, more here just how important the difference is for him, <laughs> the material difference of the incarnation, He's still operating with primarily a Platonic concept of what perfection is. What, what I think he, he, he's less sanguine about is the idea that if you just get enough Platonist metaphysics and then somebody comes along and says, have you read you know, the Gospels, you're thinking, oh, there you go. You know, everything that you wanted plus the kind of context where it becomes more communicable. Uh, so I think that, that happens. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that.